the most noble word in the English language, or its equivalent in any other language, is teacher. The only possible competitor is parent, and I would rank teacher as higher, because once you make the fundamental decision, you don't have much of a choice about parenthood, but people who teach do it, for the most part, for, for love and knowledge. And yet we do not honor teaching enough in this country. Teaching, which is the most noble of all professions, and at the secondary and primary level, the most important. We college teachers, look, minds are formed. By the time you get to us, we, we can't do a lot. We can teach knowledge of certain areas. We can teach attitudes, but the forming of minds is primary and secondary school material. That's the most important job in America. And yet we accord it low pay and low status. The situation for science teachers is worse. I hope you appreciate the reason. I don't think it's far to seek. In the sciences, there are starting level jobs in the private sector and industry at twice the salary of almost any starting teacher's salary anywhere. And so scientists do not go into science teaching. In other fields, there aren't as many as opportunities. You do have a larger pool of of better teachers. I've heard a frightening statistic, it's probably gotten somewhat better in the last couple of years, but something on the order of 50% of the teachers teaching science in American high schools were not primarily trained in that field. Don't that necessarily means they're all bad teachers, but it does indicate something not quite right. Look, this is a capitalist nation, I accept that, and we have a legitimate self-interest in our own status, and therefore I've always said somewhat facetiously, although there is a serious point to it, that the best way to resolve this issue and get it at least started on the right path would simply be to double the salary of every primary and secondary school teacher tomorrow in America. I don't think it's that simple, of course, but then at least, at least status would be set and you could begin to get a proper appreciation for this singularly most important job in the United States today. Now, the second issue outside of teaching with respect to education is that unfortunately we live in a predominantly anti-intellectual culture. It's a culture that does not tolerate a whole lot of ambiguity, which is the essence of anything intellectual in our actual world. It's very complex out there. We're not even allowed to have opinions until we're told by opinion makers what was right. I mean, it's a world of sound bites and photo opportunities. The cruelest aspect of the anti-intellectualism is what it does to kids themselves at primary and secondary school levels, because obviously children are going to reflect adult society, but in many ways they hypertrophy it, make it even make its bad characteristics even worse. And the status of the intellectual in many groups of kids is I mean, it's something I've suffered from, and I presume it still happens. I mean, in my day, the class intellectual, a kid who was interested in science, that was me, was called a square or a doofus. My son tells me today you're a wonk, a geek, or a dweeb, or something like that. <laughs> the point is that... And it ha it's, it's, that's not universal childhood. It's our culture. It must be coming out of our culture. I read a very touching article many months ago pointing out that in Korea, where science education is taken very seriously and people do it very well, kids who are good in science are class heroes. They asked one young girl who her personal hero was, and she replied, Stephen Hawking. Would one American 10-year-old in a thousand say that? That'd be great. The problem is that playground ethic, as I call it. I know because that's what I suffered from. I was called fossil face on the playground. You know, I wasn't allowed to cry, but it hurt. I tell you, it hurt. Now, I'm an obsessive. I was going to go into paleontology anyway. That wasn't going to drive me out. But others of equal or greater intellectual talent were surely driven out by that kind of attitude. It's an old saying, you've heard it, that English wars were won on the playing fields of Eton. I like to say that American careers in science have been lost by the thousands on the playgrounds of Shady Oaks Elementary School, and that's a sad thing. I just got to say one thing, that is if you suffer from that as I suffered from that, just don't let them get you. You're right, you'll prevail. It is Wednesday the 29th of August. Welcome to the ZM Global Radio Show. My name is Ben McLeish. The opening speaker was Stephen Jay Gould, a famed, respected and now sadly dead professor of um, biology and paleontology, a great public educator in the minds uh, of people who's since been 
uh, surpassed or followed by people like Richard Dawkins, who uh, also um, spoke in the same arena. And Professor Gould's uh, focus on education is, of course, a, a clear one for many people who follow the work of our movement or are gradually beginning to understand how valuable it is to have a decent education in a society that claims to be progressive, claims to be a civilization. Of course, it's, there's two aspects to it, aren't there? There is at one side, of course, the willingness and readiness and interested uh, openness of people participating as receivers of education to be open and to be flexible and to be able to learn and assimilate new information and disseminate it in new ways to meet the new challenges of the world. And on the other side, of course, the respect afforded teachers to be able to actually do their job and to be able to uh, follow a career, um, which, of course, essentially also means know that they can be provided for, knowing that um, the role of a teacher is something that's stable and has a future in the civilization. Otherwise, why would you go into it um, if uh, your means cannot be met as a, as a human being as well? Those two, of course, are central and important and will become increasingly more important uh, for global life and indeed it'll be the civilizations that uh, systematically refuse to update their education that of course will fall by the wayside as technology uh, becomes more and more complex, more and more critical to our survival on a planet uh, upon which we also live on a complete climatic knife edge and which uh, in which we face, face some very real physical um, systemic uh, challenges in the coming centuries which belief and which faith and which nationalism will simply not deliver us from. So uh, I defer to Professor Gould there for his very decent explanations of what it means to be an educator, what it means to be a teacher, why it should be looked upon and rewarded so much more than it is. So it's Wednesday the 29th, I'm coming to you from Stockholm. Uh, this will be a brief show in terms of my um, direct speaking to you. I'm, I'm going to default in a second to a recorded lecture which has not been uh, uploaded yet at all uh, that I did for the Little Green Gathering recently. I was there. This is a, a, a small festival, if it may be called such, uh, organized by the Green Party, who are a sort of, they used to be called the, um, I think they used to be called the Environmental Party or something similar to that in the UK. They organize one of these every year and they, they invite speakers from all different areas to come and sort of explain uh, their points of view with regard to what it means to have a life system, how to prioritize the natural world, and yet also create a civilization that may be called progressive, if you like. I had actually two talks given, uh, two, two talks that I made. One of them was the one you're about to hear, and there was a very brief sort of 15 minute, 30 minute sort of, uh, you know, meet me sort of thing that ran before that, which was a lot less interesting and I probably won't upload. Um, the talk I focus on, I focus on how one can create a global system that might not lead to something like um, global government and all this terrifying speak of um, the old form communist central planning and all of that. Uh, a confusion which arises actually through a misunderstanding of how systems work and how systems can be decentralized and open and yet global uh, and can be available everywhere without imposing themselves on different life systems. So I go into that so that one can argue for central planning as in a car rather than central planning as in all cars uh, being produced. Um, so uh, that is coming up in just a moment. Um, other news, uh, we can see that at the moment there are some nice, there's some nice media trickling in from the Zeitgeist Media Festival in LA. Uh, there are two of those happening in September, as far as I know, in Cardiff and in Alton in the UK. If you're around, you can check those out. Um, details are on the web for those. Um, it's very nice to see, I don't know about you, but I take a lot of comfort in seeing that people like Tim Kring and Rutger Hauer are actually coming out of the woodwork with their own um, activist uh, abilities and are coming and joining forces and helping us along with our voice as well. It's very pleasant to see that sort of uptake uh, and to see the general compatibility of, of the kind of activism that these people have uh, with the kind of talking points that we raise a lot and the associated artistic way in which those are actually distributed in ways that make people care about what the message might be, a message that might be a little bit um, dry were it only presented as a sort of a long form lecture, if you like. Um, get some emotion in there, get them to feel the difference, feel the importance and all the rest of it. So um, without any further ado, I will add my uh, piece in now and um, I will uh, await feedback from the community. Um, have a good day. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, my name is Ben McLeish. I work uh, alongside a group called the Zeitgeist Movement. I apologize for reading verbatim my script, but 
as you'll see from the nature of what I'm talking about, it's worth actually focusing very carefully and not doing it, uh, shooting from the hip, as Tim has seen me do before. Um, I've subtitled this presentation, Evolution from Linear Competition to Global Collaboration. It's sort of an attempt in one sentence to sort of describe the overall shift that we sort of have to have take place for this ever-elusive sustainability of human affairs on the planet. Uh, broadly speaking, this is sort of a, an attempt at context tonight, uh, and it's sort of my position that context is really everything. Uh, in fact, following the NHS talk, it's very interesting to note that the four very, very intelligent people who uh, were speaking about the NHS's future believed, or at least said, that it might be an accident the media didn't point out what's going on with the general corporatization of uh, the health system. That's not an accident at all. Um, it's, in fact, not even on their radar. It's not that they're suppressing it. They don't see it. It's blinkered out in a particular value system. So this is sort of where I'm stepping in now from a very, you know, you focus on a very specific structure. I'm going to explode that globally, and you might find that uncomfortable. You might find it liberating. I certainly find it liberating. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'll dedicate whatever small merit this uh, talk of mine has to the late Carl Sagan, a man of science who communicated so-called cold science in human readable form. And it's from him that I take my opening quotation. Fundamental changes in society are sometimes labeled impractical or contrary to human nature, as if there were only one human nature. But fundamental changes can clearly be made. We are surrounded by them. The old appeals to racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism are, and to rabid nationalist fervor, are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. Well, to define the word zeitgeist is easy. Uh, it's the commonly held values, the dominant moral, political, economic, and ethical value system in place during a certain historical moment. We're in one right now. Uh, transliterated from the German, it's literally the spirit of the age. Uh, institutions of social class, religious belief systems, and preferred modes of thought are all contributors to what emerge as the zeitgeist. In turn, those systems and institutions are themselves informed by the prior or emerging elements of the zeitgeist too, forming a sort of feedback loop which both affects and is the effector of the human cultural landscape. Were you born in the Dark Ages? You would believe in witches. A death penalty administered violently in public for entertainment. Uh, that toothache is caused by spiritual uncleanliness. And uh, you would also probably believe the world is flat. Since you were born today, you obviously don't hold those things to be true. Okay. Uh, anybody? Straw poll? Earth flat? No. Right. Okay. My point is made for me. So, uh, but to define the current actual zeitgeist is actually much harder. In uncovering the present value system, which acts as a bedrock to many established practices, priorities, and modes of operation, one often finds oneself in the very box one is attempting to define from the outside. Our thinking itself contains the syntaxes we're trying to lay bare and analyze. The conclusions drawn are met with attitudes and reactions which are themselves informed by the assumed truths of those cultures and therefore often block critical thinking in order to preserve the current order. So as I proceed with this talk, try and be mindful that both you and I are interfacing through cultural filters which can themselves skew what is being brought up for discussion. Nevertheless, I'll try and be as unbiased as I am. All right, so who are we? All right, the Zeitgeist Movement is a non-political, non-religious, global social education effort to realign cultural values in an attempt to bring about true social change. We perceive the great crises of today in economics, ecology, crime, mental and physical health, and the provisions of resources such as energy, nutrition, water, and the associated industrial practices thereof to be negative byproducts of a misaligned Zeitgeist. Sagan's opening quotation sets the frame very clearly, we live on a planet together. The socio-cultural ecological foundation of that planet is a unique and singular system of life support. Our actions and our behaviors as nations, as states, and as individuals are now both global in scope and effect. A nuclear disaster in Japan affects everyone um, and everything in the world on a level that acts beyond political barriers, borders, level of industrialization, and social class. And ultimately, the crisis of resources and energy, nutrition, political corruption, and pollution affect the same scope, the global frame, the human family as a whole. As such, the Zeitgeist Movement approaches these problems and approaches the solutions thereto on a global, unified level. I invite you to the following riddle by way of illustration of the importance of such an approach. Okay, you're trapped in a steel-lined room, utterly airtight, utterly watertight. One exit, only one exit, firmly locked steel door. 
It's held in place by three hinges, each with two screws apiece, which are firmly screwed into the steel wall. The room also features three fist-sized holes in the ceiling. I don't know why I said fist-sized, but I did. No human being can fit through those holes, and they will not suffice as an exit strategy. Now, being the nature-loving scout that you are, you have a pen knife which can, with some effort, unscrew these mountings at a maximum rate of one screw per minute. The mathematically minded among you will have already deduced that that means a total unscrewing time of at least six minutes, plus the few seconds it takes to move on to the next screw. Good news! You can be uh, free in just over six minutes, except that, of course, the room will fill with water through the three ceiling holes with ice-cold water, and the room will be filled in four minutes. How do you get out in time without drowning? No. There's no two pen knives. Right? Well, you... Um, it's very simple. You pick up the key at your feet, open the door, and leave. <laughs> Sorry, did I forget that? All oh, right. Okay, fine. Perhaps you feel cheated. It feels unfair, perhaps, to be presented with this so-called riddle without the vital information which would provide the only correct response. In fact, the very moral outrage you might be feeling, that you've been cheated out of solving a riddle by being presented with deficient information, is an implicit admission that you recognize the basic truth, that you can only be expected to solve a problem if you have sufficient information and as many variables as possible to take into account. Now, I want you to hold on to that truth as I continue, because to actually re resolve the root causes of our social issues, to evolve and progress beyond the need for patchwork actions against the ill effects of our problems, beyond uh, all of that, to solve them actually requires a unified global approach to diagnosis, to treatment, and to architecture of the solutions. The problem is not the steel-lined, airtight room or the water in which you will drown. They are not actually the cause of your drowning, no. They are the resulting byproducts, the killer symptoms of the actual root cause, which is the ignorance of the key at your feet. No? Have I lost all of you? All right. It's going well. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's briefly run down the architecture of our present systems. I apologize if I'm running over uh, well-turfed ground. I know I'm among friends tonight who value the ecology differently. But I do need to uh, uh, sort of point this out. And to do so, I borrow liberally from Jeremy Rifkin's Third Industrial Revolution. Right, okay. So it takes nine pounds of feed grain to make one pound of steak. This means only 11% of the feed goes to produce the beef itself, with the rest either burned off as energy in the conversion process, used to maintain bodily functions, or extracted or absorbed into parts of the body that are not eating, hair and bones and things like that. So while we bemoan the energy efficiency and waste of driving gas guzzling cars, the energy and efficiency of waste of supporting grain oriented meat dieting is much worse. But from there, it gets better. So nearly one third of the grain grown in the world today is actually fed to animals rather than food grain for direct human consumption. So while a small portion of the wealthiest consumers luxuriate, high up on the food chain, hundreds of millions of other human beings face malnutrition, starvation, and death. Uh, farmers have to use large quantities of fossil fuel-based petroleum fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides to grow the feed grain. Additional fossil fuel is expended to operate farm equipment. Trucks, trains, and ships using even more fossil fuels, must be deployed to transport the grain to giant mechanized feedlots where it's consumed by the cattle. Step two. On the feedlot, the animals are administered with a host of pharmaceutical products, including growth-stimulating hormones, feed additives, and the occasional antibiotics, again using more energy. They, of course, get crammed together. They might have 50,000 or more uh, head of cattle in one place, which means, of course, they start getting diseases like rhinotracheitis, it's a good name, isn't it? And uh, conjunctivitis and all the rest of that. So to prevent the diseases, highly toxic insecticides derived, again, from fossil fuels are sprayed from high-pressure hoses, fogging the pens with poison. Once they're fattened, the cattle are transported for hours and even days in vans on the way to slaughterhouses, again, expending additional fossil fuel energy. At the slaughterhouse, the animals enter the killing floor, single file, where they're stunned by a pneumatic gun and fall to the ground. A worker hooks the chain onto a rear hoof and hoists the animal upside down. You've actually seen the rest, haven't you, if you've seen the movie uh, Earthlings or anything like that. The dead animal moves along the electricity-powered disassembly line, where a machine strips the animal of its hide and the organs are removed. Electric power saws are then used to cut the carcass into recognizable chunks. <laughs> I love that phrase. <laughs> Including... Uh, Chuck, ribs, brisket, and steak. The cuts are tossed onto electric-powered conveyor belts. I've actually worked at a meat factory. It does. It is quite remarkable. The whole thing, meanwhile, of course, being kept at, what, minus eight through huge amounts of expended fossil fuels. Uh, the vacuum-packed cuts of beef are then shipped into supermarkets across the country in air-conditioned trucks. 
Upon arrival at the supermarket, the cuts are repackaged in plastic made out of fossil fuels and displayed in air-cooled, brightly lit shelves at the meat counter. Customers drive their cars to the stores, purchase the steak and store it in their freezer or their refrigerator before cooking it on their gas or electric ovens and then consumed. Three cheers for Mr. Rifkin for putting that all together for me. So that's a small portion of our presently architectured our, our agricultural machine. Notice that at no point is there any real mechanism for measuring available resources or even a remote attempt at efficient function. Instead, every step of this value chain appears as an act of consumption and output and unjudged unit shifting operation that veers blindly forward, wildly burning resources in its wake. No value is placed on energy input beyond simple financial costs and do not interrelate truly with resources anyway if there are any financial costs. We'll be seeing more of that, by the way. So, okay, how about energy production itself um, before it is so liberally expended and wasted? to violent detrimental effect upon environment and life health. Let's just look at one fairly recent example of hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which is being employed to harness natural gas from shale layers across the world. I can already hear the hatred in the room. They have what, three sites in the UK now, is it? Three that we know of? So, hydraulic fracturing, they fire um, water and chemicals very deep down into uh, shale layers where they then uh, basically react to crack open huge areas of rock to uh, capture the shale natural gas. What does that actually require? You've already seen it. 400 diesel chugging trucks to supply water on site for the fracking operation. Each well requires 1.8 million gallons of water required for each frack. You can frack one well 18 times. Per fracture, 40,000 tons of chemicals are also required. Many of these 600 different chemicals are carcinogenic or do not break down, including mercury, formaldehyde, ethylene glycol, and others. So let's do some very basic math about just the U.S. 500,000 sites in the U.S. alone, which can be fracked 18 times each. That's the stated maximum so far. That's 72 trillion gallons of water and 360 billion gallons of chemicals just in America. And a resultant gain of, what, 300,000 barrels of natural gas a day, non-renewable as well. Again, the negative side of the ledger actually just vanishes from the market system. It's just gone. It's not even there. It's not even to be worried about. Permanently polluted water with chemicals that do not break down. Think uh, Silent Spring. Think DDT. Um, rising health issues. Uh, those health treatment costs will appear positive on the GDP. Thing. NHS again. Yeah? Oh, GDP's going. That's fine. More people with cancer. More oil and fuel-based uh, medicines to treat them with, rather than actually just not doing all of this. And the negative psychosocial effects and life costs remain absolutely invisible. So the cumulative effect of general operation within energy, agriculture, and our other behaviors is now pretty evident. Species extinction levels are now over a thousand times the normal rate. Ocean dead zones and plastic continents. Topsoil erosion rates, according to the Encyclopedia of Life Support Systems, are worldwide running at a level of 5 to 7 million hectares every year. In other words, 70,000 square kilometers of fertile lands lost from intensive use every year. The ruin and depletion of soils accelerated greatly, of course, in the 20th century due to the excessive plowing of vast areas, exterminations of forests, greatly increased mechanizations of soil management and crop firing, and the paucity of measures to protect soils. Again, that's just a side of the legend that just vanishes. Toxins, chemical byproducts, and plastics are now found in the smallest and largest of organisms. Cancer rates rising. Who would I insult by proclaiming, therefore, that this system is more wasteful than any in history, both in sheer numbers of consumed resources, pollution, and global reach? It seems obvious to the point of dullness that we are operating at a level of waste that we obviously cannot sustain, and which is unseen everywhere in the biological processes of the planet. No life form survives by wasting its core resources. Now, the problem actually runs a bit deeper than that. Um, and this is something the NHS guys didn't say. Um, look, underlying the logic of these environmental effects, the governing dynamics that run them all and form their operational natures and value associations, beneath all that sits a financial system which is implicitly incapable of applying a value or need for protection of the environment or even efficiency in systems of human society. We track what we like to call money sequences as they despoil the life means of the planet in the process of just making more money. All other life systems on the planet use available life means to generate more life. As such, the negative consequences of our operations are utterly masked behind and lost through 
this thought syntax that this that judges value and efficiency and success. To quote University of Guelph professor John McMurtry, global biophysical laws themselves are ignored. The structure of false assumptions built into private commodity science blinkers out reality beyond sales, but the depletion, degradation, and collapse of life support systems in consequences do not disappear. They deepen. It is true that enjoyment of the aggregated commodity, prestige, and money uh, gains lull elites and the sciences to sleep with their life-blind paradigm, but the regime disorder still grows. This is why life and life support system destruction has become ever larger scaled, with the sciences enabling every blind step to the results they do not take into account. This is also why research for arms sales, genetic piracy, and patent impoverishment of originators, chemically adulterated food chains, assembly line mass mutilation of animals for cosmetics, it's just something I didn't even include, increasingly ecocidal energy extraction systems and so forth go on with no rational or scientific correction, with progressively catastrophic costs and losses to human and ecological life excluded as externalities, commodity science proves false at a level that is not comprehended. This is the kind of stuff that, it, I know that all sounds really abstract, but the next time you see the BBC unable to to take in or do anything but discard one side of the argument. This is what's happening. It, it is implicit to our operation. It's not a matter of voting. It's not a matter of lobbying. It's not a matter of any of those things. It's a very, very specific systemic issue. So, okay, I've depressed you enough. Right? I hope there's a, there's a bucket for tears going around. The NHS had money. Ours has got tears. So we have um, two great needs then. On the one side, the basic value realignment has to occur from a cultural concern with money and a value system of money to one of real-world operational actual efficiency, a human value set which drops demand for unnecessary and wasteful goods and practices to one of sustainable and realigned values which take into account the carrying capacity of the planet and deliberate open architectures to support all human, plant and animal life in the wider biosphere. If we internalize the public value set of Carl Sagan's realization that we are one planet, then we must approach our attitude to correct life behaviors on that planet from a planetary point of view. So that's the first one. The second great shift is to re-employ our scientific understandings we've gained through the millennia to maximize the operational efficiency of all life systems themselves, to provide healthy nutrition, sustainable energy systems, and less wasteful and harmful transport and other physical attributes of our life organization. Education, not voting, will bring about this change. Imagine how small the NHS would be if there wasn't so many pollutants around. It would actually be a way of fixing that problem, wouldn't it? But what sort of uh, function can a global system have without becoming a domineering one world government of corporatization and control, which is the sort of what the current system is sort of aiming for? Um, can we affect a system that is global and decentralized and open? Well, a few examples actually already exist, and I wanted to use them as thought experiments to explain how we might cooperatively engineer an architecture that allows freedom, uh, innovation, dynamic feedback in resource tracking and use, implicit sort of built into that architecture without the need for humans demanding their rights through politics or protest. George Bard already proved beyond a doubt that doesn't work when he was evicted from Occupy London. An architecture which, by its own logic, its own structure, can provide a healthy bedrock for real progress on the planet. Well, uh, Lawrence Lessig, in his 2002 lecture, The Internet's Coming, Silent Spring, noted the following. Architectures allow societies and environments and architectures can forbid, but the thing the world has got to learn is that architectures allow. The architectures you built allow. It's not just law that builds freedom. It's architectures. So let's expand on what he said. This is the internet. You've always wondered what it looked like. Right? It's rather small. It's bigger than that in real life. Um, this is an architecture that allows. There's no controlling center to it. There's no central planning to it. There is a common protocol that allows traffic, of course, and yes, there is a W3C consortium that sort of mandates domain names and additional or newer protocols and keeps the general standards, but they don't control anything. Uh, ultimately, it's an end-to-end -end system where computers don't have to be from a certain company in order to function for certain websites. We do not vote for what content should be on it. The innovation centers are on the outer edge at the user end. As such, it's a complete inversion of the top-down model. The top-down model that includes agriculture, by the way, it's a one-way system. 
Um, censorship, where it exists for the internet, only weakens the fabric of the architecture and is vehemently fought off still. Um, it's played a, a pivotal role in the Arab Spring. Anyone can innovate on this architecture, write programs. The guy who wrote Hotmail was 20-something at the time, sold it for 400 million, but he was just some dude. He didn't know what he was writing. He didn't know what he was creating. He just did it. Um, no control, just there, just an open architecture, an open playing field. The strength, reliability, and efficiency of this system comes from the fact that it isn't precisely top-down, controlled, state-based, closed, private, public, order-defined, or linear. This is a system that allows by its structure. So when censorship or, or moves against neutrality of the technologies and frameworks are attempted on the system, always by usually incumbent controlling interest groups from the old top-down model, the end-to-end -end architecture ceases to function as well as it would and is fairly good at defending itself. The efficiency and usefulness of this system demands implicit in its architecture, in its development, the very opposite of central government or secretive control. There are no country boundaries to the Internet. Information and knowledge is most potent when shared and built upon. Uh, there's an old adage in the library world that information wants to be free. That's very true, isn't it? I mean, information isn't information unless you know it, <laughs> or at least you can get it. It's a model of implicit access, a set of technological standards which translate across the globe to be built in new and unexpected directions. That's it. The Internet has not gone down for a single day since its inception because the decentralized nature of the system architecture itself lends the strength and reliability to it. Its endpoints are also its sources. The reliability and access is not voted in, it isn't lobbied for. The liberating factors of this system are part of the genetics of the technology itself. It is a sort of, it's this sort of cooperation that we sort of advocate as a movement, more broadly as an approach to sort of social re-architecture. Well, what happens when you have a shared end-to-end -end system, an architecture that actively allows the end user informed innovation-prone behaviors of the global population? Well. On top of those protocols, on top of all of that, and the bedrock of open information relay, sort of come secondary systems of sort of structured knowledge. Wikipedia, currently at 22 million articles, of which 4 million alone are just in English. It's also end-to-end, -end, just like the net architecture that delivers it to your Mac, like it does to my PC. The fastest growing and now the largest encyclopedia in the world. And we wrote it. And among its own architectures are the features of open editorial membership. Anyone can edit or create pages. I know I've created many. Um, unicorns are real, by the way. Uh, community efforts uh, for structure, grouping, and series of articles are all enabled by this collaborative mechanism. All attributes of the system, which is based on another system of similar open end-to-end -end synergy. And it is free at point of access, like the NHS was meant to be. Because dissemination of and participation in the information process is most efficient when it's free. Free as in directs uh, itself in all directions and free as in money. It's a model of access again, not of ownership. Now, such an integrated system of information relay can be applied and needs to be applied to the management and tracking of global energy and resource consumption as well. As a very simple example, a sort of pocket example, HP Labs created the Central Nervous System for the Earth, or SENSE, in 2009 which is a system of trillions of nano-sensors distributed around the globe which could detect earthquakes ahead of time and, in the words of HP, revolutionize human interaction with the Earth as profoundly as the Internet has revolutionized personal and business interactions. Unfortunately, the first commercial use has been to drill for oil, but this somewhat underlines the point for me. Technological capabilities of our race are a prerequisite of, but they're not a guarantee of, safe and abundant futures for us. Naturally, we need to apply our technology in ways that benefit the goal of sustainable life operation. And they need to be non-corporate, but a commonly deployed, upgradable, and ubiquitous system. Now, the result of the Internet's architecture has been an extreme jump in the efficiencies of communication. Burning less fossil fuels through a drop in hand delivery of documents, through postal and delivery services, a speeding up of um, information availability to a near instantaneous degree, and the ability to network and apply healthcare information, and uh, dropping reliance on wood and pulp for paper manufacture. Educational possibilities are now massively advanced with a number of free online resources which deliver information for nothing. At this point, it actually becomes sensible to echo the words of Buckminster Fuller, the famed uh, uh, industrial architect and social engineer, who said, 
You never change things by fighting the existing reality. You change, to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So we need to stop fighting the fires and innovate our way past our problems. So much of the internet and Wikipedia and all that then as a model of architectures that allow whose operational attributes are open and interconnected. Can we apply such a dynamic open architecture to other areas of society on a more directly physical systems level, beyond information? Well, let's look at the energy dynamic. <clears throat> wrong with me? What is interesting to note in our uh, present energy system, as sort of briefly denoted by those prior examples, is that these systems function sort of on a top-down level, very unlike the internet. Large energy companies in a monopolistic and cartel-like manner are sole providers of one-directional, non-renewable energies across distribution systems that are also one way. Uh, we see nothing like the stability of the internet here. Brownouts and blackouts are extremely common in the current energy paradigm. Uh, by comparison with the internet, which has just never gone down, so it's infinitely more poor, uh, with the most recent example affecting, where? India. How many people? 600 million people over uh, a, couple of, um, a couple of weeks. So it's not nothing that we're talking about here. So this top-down logic becomes, it comes as a byproduct of this old second industrial revolution model that we've had to employ until now, where private capital was sort of employed to build such systems. Fossil fuels that underlie the construction processes used to create the systems, as well as the energy actually that runs on it, uh, are actually, by definition, localized in central areas. There are particular wells, aren't there? Um, but fossil fuels are now declining. I don't have to convince anyone in here. I do have to convince some libertarians who think it's actually going up. <laughs> the US peak of oil per capita was, what, met in 1970? Since then, we've been using three barrels of oil for every one barrel we find. Corn stock ethanol and tar sands, like the project in Alberta, Canada, are actually net loss energy efforts, meaning that more energy is expended to create the ethanol or harvesting the tar sand energy than one can burn or obtain from it. Um, again, we can only become aware of this net effect when the whole picture is considered, when we do that steel line room key thing. Uh, and the life-blind economic attitudes uh, to it sort of etch out this side of the bargain instead calculating only profits gained from the sales of the results with the loss associated in money capital only uh, from the enterprise itself, the negative side. However, wonderful news, uh, renewable energies, particularly solar and wind, can be harvested in many different areas and hyper-locally. You do it on this building. Uh, the employment of photo photovoltaic structures or, uh, or paints even uh, can turn most houses into micro-generators of energy that can be fed into a grid that operates bi-directionally rather than one-directionally through something called a smart grid, which I'm sure you all know about. Uh, wind energies can be harnessed in many locations too. By definition, this system is decentralized like the internet. It is the internet of energy. Such an architecture can protect and prevent the dropouts in operation far better than any safety guidelines or measures taken to try and fix the incumbent top-heavy one-directional system we are emerging out of. It's intermittency issues of renewables are already being addressed in many ways. In fact, there was a guy on TED a couple of months ago who solved it. But it's all for nothing if our values don't actually fall in line with the natural order of the planet and give rise to the absolute, informed, unquestioned demand for such systems in the first place. And as we are currently in a system where you have to earn your freedom in society, the lobbying efforts by incumbent energy companies and international banking systems, whose interests are, of course, still tied to the old dying paradigms, and whose earnings in part actually come from the limitation, the scarcity, the suboptimal operation of these structures, prevents the fast-tracking and genuinely stable, efficient deployment of the technologies we need to avert serious catastrophe and improve human welfare considerably. How about manufacturing? So presently, we manufacture many goods in the poorest areas of the world, again, in order to maximize the money sequence of value, paying the workforce who will settle for the least. Those goods are then shipped again in fuel-chugging megatankers to the points of distribution. This also feeds into how agriculture is, of course, processed in manufacturing. Foods are transported across great distances to be washed. In fact, I think in France, there's a place where they drive the potatoes to Italy to have them washed, and then they bring them back to have them peeled, because it's cheaper somehow. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm feeling more sane every day. Um, and ultimately, they go out to distribution centers to be sold to massive environmental cost, not factored into the equation of value. Well, several technologies now, of course, exist here that can actually function in a non-top-down, distributed and efficient way. The realm of 3D printing is only just becoming a consumer reality. 
inexpensive and multifunctional machines, sometimes called printer bots or rep wraps, can three-dimensionally print toys, household items, or machine parts, or in fact, spare parts for the 3D printers themselves, which I love. Um, yes, this drops the need for mass transit, lorries, storage, distribution, and brings manufacturing to hyperlocal levels. It brings it to your living room uh, when you need it. No storage. Great. And the Pirate Bay recently added a physical section to the design uh, to the, to where the designs for items can actually just be downloaded onto your printer bot, and you can then publish it. Shame that they banned the Pirate Bay in the UK. Yeah. Pirateproxy.net, go. Um, but look, this is an architecture. This is an architecture that allows, it's an architecture that actually fixes the problem. No amount of international tanker VAT tax and protests and all that other bullshit is ever going to fix it. This is how you fix them. You build it in. Uh, you, you approach it from a technical point of view. All right, so... Since we started with agriculture, why, what about agricultural practices? Some people will recognize what this is. Some people have no fucking idea what it is. And that's probably better news because it's nice to learn about this stuff. Um, those practices which waste maximally more energy and take up all those spaces that we were talking about in return for increasingly dangerous suboptimal sub produce, makes us sick, greater animal suffering, all that stuff. Uh, the field of vertical soilless agriculture certainly promises clean, operationally efficient, and space-efficient implementations, even within cities. Until now, the extensive land requirements have uh, divided produce from recipients, especially with rural flight, when everyone moved into the cities. Um, thus, the, the use of pesticides and herbicides and other fossil fuel-based products can drop as you have an our controlled environment, and the decreased reliance on fossil fuels for transport and refrigeration make for a compelling case for the reorganization of food production, again, with the efficiency simply built into the implementation. And when it comes to uh, uh, transportation itself, we're now seeing major innovations, such as Google's self-driving car, uh, which has now clocked, as of yesterday, 300,000 uh, miles with not a single accident. And there was another one, it was a Hyundai, that went 170,000 miles, it had one accident, a human ran into the back of it. <laughs> so, humans are not good at that stuff, man. Make it, make it. If you're afraid of getting on a, an automated thing, don't ever go on the Docklands Light Railway because that's been automated for years and no one noticed. And when they do notice, they panic. They go, oh my god, oh, everything's fine. Uh, anyway, uh, all right, okay. Other things like maglev transportation thing on the left there, uh, magnetic levitation, almost zero drag, extreme speeds. We're talking intercontinental travel. Fossil fuels are going. You're not going to be able to get into a plane. Uh, we're going to have to start building architectures that are not only extremely efficient, but hey, guess what? You can get to China in 45 minutes. Who wants to go? Come on, let's go. Um, these, are, these are the actual solutions. Um, blah, blah, blah. Where was I? Yes, there's also something that's actually been around in Germany for years. It's just picking up here. Uh, it's called Stadtauto in Germany. It's called City Car here or Zip Cars, uh, which are essentially um, internet based. Uh, car rental services, you go pick the car up from particular streets and you go and use it for a number of hours or a number of days and then put it back again. It drops the use of overall car consumption. You seem to want one of everything in this culture. And I personally can't stand that I own a car or have to own a car. I have a chat to Chris who runs his car on vegetable oil. Look, what, what's the what's the mileage? Uh, 60, miles to the 60, mile, six, 60, 60 miles to the gallon. <sighs> six miles six. Miles to the gallon better than my diesel. All right, I thought I was winning. Damn it. Anyway, these sort of systems can sort of increase access to transport while decreasing individual demand to absolutely have to have your own car and be a participant in that travel. And if we really want to truly follow the roots of efficiency, renovation of all the complete new buildings of cities, unified in transport and architecture, just like the water and sewage systems are right now, will also have to come about at some point. Implicit also to the technological advances, advancements is the idea of automation of jobs. And this is something I've not dwelled on very much, but very briefly, automated farming has been with us for a very long time now with less than 1% of the population doing what 90% plus of the population used to be involved in. The most efficient manufacturing is automated. Automated cars will drop accidents due to human error and have already been proven safe to use. Fuel efficient, less stressful to the people. Just think you can actually do something when you're driving for five hours. Some companies have automated the construction of housing through an enlarged application of sort of 3D printing technologies. And it uses much less resources. Presently, 30 to 40% of all resources we have goes on construction. Automation frees human beings 
from dangerous and hard labor and drops our reliance on resources simultaneously while allowing for better fabrication of houses or whatever it is they're producing. And this is actually happening extremely quickly. Um, I brought it up this morning with this gentleman, Brian, I think his name was, from the Green Party, who was talking about where money comes from. He, was, he mentioned automation of jobs. And uh, next year, in 2013, Foxconn, who make everybody's iPhone, will add a million automated robots to their factory lines. So that's a million jobs in uh, a few days, gone. Not to be replaced anywhere else, because it's cheaper to automate, so everyone starts doing it. And of course, as we develop our technological abilities, we can start automating things we used to dream were unautomatable. For example, brain surgery. Who, who here would be operated on for brain surgery by a computer? You're probably thinking, oh no, it's dangerous. I guarantee you that at one point, one day, we're going to get to a point where people look back and go, I can't believe that we used to allow fallible human beings to operate on something as complex as a brain. That's amazing they used to do that. It's very much like pulling teeth in the Middle Ages. We think it's crazy now. They will think we're crazy in the future. All of that means I've lost my place. Uh, <laughs> This sort of this sort of generalization of, of automation do it does need to be rolled out as we come closer to advanced AI possibilities, freed from unrewarding and in many cases unnecessary dangerous jobs. Humanity can actually pursue new realms of learning and teaching, free time, and guess what? How about meaningful interaction with the family of seven billion we have so far only been hearing of in passing? So, if you've been following my general logic uh, of what makes all these systems work well, what makes them good? You might actually have come to the mindset that the Zeitgeist movement deliberately advocates, for which we get a lot of stick without this sort of context. Um, these systems work best when not built according to what can be afforded in a monetary system, but what can be optimally designed using the best of today's technology. Not tomorrow's, it's not sci-fi, right now. To provide high quality access for all people relying on these systems. In the process, automating ever greater portions of these bedrock systems upon which culture can then develop in uninhibited and uncoerced directions. Humans require absolutely water, energy, nutrition, housing. We now have the technology to do this everywhere in a resource efficient way together. We will not manage if we decide that we need to sort of earn a profit off it or something like that. Profit is at the expense of a system efficiency or just of another human being. And we hold that profiting off a need is inherently a violent act. We're in the 21st century, people. We're not even living up to the sci-fi anymore. The basics ought to be provided without a price tag. So, coupling abundance-generating technologies with a value system, implicitly understanding of the real fabric of human society will mean the real emancipation of the human race. The realization that my well-being is only as good as yours. And if there is a class of people starving, worse off, mistreated, or shamed by lack of access, constantly comparing themselves to the conspicuously consumptive neighbors, not only might I find myself among their number one day, but their objection risks the safety of themselves and others, provoking crime and mental health problems brought on by the social stresses of social inequality. With such a value system, we face the very real possibility of being actually tough on crime by eradicating the true causes. The environmental issues will be solved through proper system applications, technical solutions, applied knowledge for human concern. Of course, as stated previously, this move, while essential to the well-being of the complete socio-eco-cultural economic habitat, sorry about that phrase, I was very tired and on a lot of coffee when I wrote it, isn't going to be achieved easily. Um, the current zeitgeist has an inbuilt cultural preservation immune system. Unappointed guardians of the status quo oppose this change, even when the current normality invisibly limits their own lives. Like a religion, there is a certain emotional investment, a, a, a portion of your identity that's sort of bound up with any current paradigm. But those paradigms change as people's minds change. That's why our movement, and increasingly other similar movements, have set about communicating the logic of what we ultimately refer to as a resource-based economic model, or an earth economy, or an open source civilization. We do this through websites, technology, education, resources, free films, talks, online radio broadcasts, or live media festivals where we invite socially conscious artists from increasingly mainstream sources to help us build an emotional component into this somewhat dry train of thought sometimes. We run a yearly day of lectures, we perform street activism, whatever, whatever we can think of. So far we've meet, reached millions and with this sort of train of thought. Uh, whether it's pursued is up to them, but may be promoted uh, as the current paradigm begins to falter and fail for ever more people. 
But that is, of course, what we're racing against. And most importantly, uh, we, of course, continually take in as much education as possible ourselves for the body of knowledge coming from the scientific inquiry is sort of growing all the time. Critical mass of understanding in the public mind is the goal. One day soon, we hope, humanity will meet that critical mass, which will drive the change, drive the active deployment of life systems, finally independent from a bottom line of monetary numbers, and the movement will be able to actually cease operation as we enter the first real civilization. That's the, that's the other thing that sets us apart from politics. We don't want to exist anymore. Uh, every other political party wants to get into power and stay for as long as possible. That's the opposite of what we want. We're sort of an anti-institution for an anti-institutional future. Advocates uh, for a tangible change, meaningful, functional solutions, speaking for Earth, as Carl Sagan would say, and in support of all who live on it. So that's it from me and from everyone here at uh, ZM Global. I hope you enjoyed this week. Uh, we will be back again next week with our usual programming again. We'll be cycling through to the next speaker. We might have Jim back or somebody like that. But the uh, information will be going out in due course. And keep looking for more feedback from the Media Festival and uh, some upcoming events. Uh, we've got a few bits of uh, work uh, coming along the way. And I wish you all the very best where you all are in this uh, world and wish you... Uh, a good week until then. Bye-bye.